School should be the safest place to fail, right? Because it's a practice for life. Yeah. School is a practice for life. Unfortunately, many children experience the reverse of that, that you're, and you're written off. And, and not by the teachers deliberately, just by the system. My name is Nick Nagarko and you are locked into Culture TV. For the culture, by the culture. Let's go. Andrew, thank you so much for coming down today. You're welcome. It's good to be here. How are you? I'm very good. Yeah, very good. It's not like we didn't go out for dinner last night. No, it's <laughs> <laughs> it was good dinner, wasn't it? It, it was, was yeah. really nice. <laughs> Enjoyed it. So, yeah. for the sake of our listeners, obviously we've we've known each other a while and we've got a really great, uh-huh. great friendship. But for the yeah. sake of uh, our viewers and listeners, um, you have been in education for 21 years. You're the senior director of learning at Discovery currently. I am. That's and right. something that we have discussed over it over the time that we've that we've known each other but i thought was a very interesting con- conversation to have on a show like culture um what is it about the culture in school and i don't mean i don't mean what the teachers they don't mean like your your, your times tables and your abcs mm. what what mm. i mean is like what is it about how the culture in your school shapes who you are as a person forever well it does it really does it's that hidden curriculum bit you know the bit that lies well, what do you mean by behind... hidden curriculum well i always I've call it you that. say this a lot i know but... i say it a lot actually i think what i mean is um what lies behind the grade is yeah. you know attitudes behaviors yeah. character you yeah. know how you're formed and forged really mm-hmm. And I think that can be to a degree influenced by what you're taught in terms of the the visible curriculum. But I think it's even more influenced by the invisible stuff, which is the relationships that you have with with your teachers and with each other, the different sort of daily interactions. Mm -hmm. You know, how how, I keep coming back to how we do things around here, which is which is cultural rather than uh, curriculum based. You can't you can't codify these things and systematize them and and rank them and, and and so forth. I think they're just it's part of. I mean, a Philip Jackson, brilliant author, would say it's it's learning to live in a crowd, isn't it? Yeah. You know, and I, I think those exactly, are the things that yeah. are the lasting and I think lessons it, that we learn. Really is there enough school. importance put on it? Like, you can go through life, um, and you may well be academically, yeah, on paper, yeah. extremely bright. But mm. if you lack the ability to form, develop, engage, and grow relationships with people, like, so true. How do you, how can you ever work your way through life? And, and is school, put, uh, is the education system putting en- enough emphasis on the fact that we need to help and support and educate young people into becoming functioning, yeah, quite, collaborative, quite. Pro- positive, productive members of society rather than... I think it gets back to what school is for at the end of the day and i think maybe to a certain extent i think we're still somewhat stymied by the original uh, assumptions as to what the purpose of school is and what, what were the original well if you go back i mean i know there's been obviously independent schools and things around for hundreds and hundreds of years you know in certain other schools that have been around for centuries but really if you look at sort of state education in the uk yeah that dates back to just over 150 years to 1870 forced state Act. education yeah so maintained sector schools so schools that are government funded to 1870, which is the Education Reform Act, Forster's Act, William Forster. It's called Forster's Act. And then, if you look back then, and it was a benevolent thing to do, so I'm not about to sort of rip it to shreds by any means. I mean, it was a brilliant thing to bring children, uh, well, let's put it bluntly, down from chimneys and out of workhouses in where they were doing jobs that were far too, you know, they were far too young to be doing, to give them an education. Um, and was that compulsory and, then? Indeed, and it was suggested at the time, Im- implicitly, that um, in order to make sure that we maintained our standing in the world, our status in the world as yeah. an industrial powerhouse that we were, mm-hmm. we needed more white collar workers rather than just blue collar workers. And what I mean by that is we need those who are able to um, use those sort of admin skills of reading yeah. and writing and calculating and all yeah. those different things are important uh as important as the other skills that were being used but it was felt that we needed to increase the academic intelligence of our children mm-hmm. we needed a, a better educated workforce which would lead to a more prosperous ec- economy you know mm. and to a certain extent that's true and that's been borne out but to an, another degree 
that's a myopic view of what education's about. It's not yeah. just about the three R's, is it? You know, it's not yeah. just arithmetic. Well, I call it reading, writing, and regurgitating. It isn't just that. That's important. But I think we're now beginning to see that, hang on a minute, if you were to start again with a new act that mandated education for everybody, yeah. would you say that the purpose of that is to deliver an academic, intelli- an academic education? Yeah. I don't know that you would, actually. Why? Well, because I think there's a great many other aspects of life that require more than that. I mean, as someone said to me not long ago, an A star in, in maths is brilliant. Mm-hmm. But how does that help your marriage? How does that work? How does yeah. that work? Somebody tell me, you know, an, an A in geography is brilliant, but how does that make you a better friend? Yeah. You know, a, a, a B in English, you know, fantastic, difficult subject, well done. How does that make you a, a better partner? Well, the answer to that is, well, it was never intended to help with that. Mm. Okay, so which part of the curriculum is? Mm. Do you know what I mean? But how do you teach that? Well, you model it. I mean, this is the thing. And who this would is be why... the teacher that says, I'm really great <laughs> at being a good citizen? <laughs> Well, that's what teachers have to do. You know, yeah. but it is. I mean, it's, it's a big ask. Because as a teacher, you're not just a knowledge delivery system, you know. Yeah. It'd be easier if you were, frankly, but you're yeah. not. You're not. And nobody wants to be just that. So you're not just there to deliver the curriculum. You're there to model. Yeah. Uh, I don't like the phrase, but, you know, good citizenship, you know. Yeah. Uh, you know, how to... Uh, um, Look after yourself yeah. and others, you know, how to preserve, I think, the most important thing in life, which for me has always been self-worth. Mm. I, mean, I don't mean I'm very good at it, but <laughs> self-worth is the thing you need because yeah. it's from self-worth that leads to self-discipline and then you can reach your potential. So it's all those things. And your question is, can you teach it? Well, I think you model it mm-hmm. and you create a culture in school yeah. which kind of allows those things to flourish yeah. without grading them <laughs> yeah the moment you start grading things it stifles growth doesn't it you know i think grading sorting and ranking is do you think they should be grading maths and english science etc yeah i do yeah yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm not anti-grading yeah um but what i'm saying is that if you value other things in school as well such as character education you know yeah collaboration cooperation 21st century schools goes on yeah um knowledge of the environment and so yeah. forth just because you value it doesn't necessarily mean that it should automatically lead to a grading system mm-hmm. you know, and an assessment program mm-hmm. i suppose what i'm getting at is it is perfectly possible to value things in school mm-hmm. without then having the default setting of well we need to we need to rush into an assessment program then to, yeah. to grade it because at the moment you start doing that i think children will just believe that they're the sum of their grades and they're yeah. not they're not they never were they i think it's were. it's interesting like when as an adult i can empathize a lot more with the role and responsibility of a teacher and the pressure that <laughs> that comes with that it's not an easy job as a child oh, in no. school i terrorized Fair teachers game. yeah and i hated them <laughs> I mean, I took great. Why? Why did you not like them then? Um, I didn't. I was the most anti-authoritarian yeah, person probably going. I mean, I still am. That's why I work for myself. I mean, but I think, I think I'm naturally that way. But I think life in itself sort of pushed me further yeah. down down that route. You're driven. Got yeah. Your own sort of self motivation, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, but 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 here's the thing, though. You see, because. It's changed so much. What, what's changed? Well, I think just the way that children live and learn has changed. And I'll just explain very briefly why I think that. Yeah. It's no longer the case. And I think it's, this is refreshing to say this. I'm pleased that it's no longer the case. That you you will respect your elders. Yeah. <laughs> you know, children are... Sp- uh, 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 but why do you it? think it's not the case? Seen and not heard. Well, well, first of all, it was the case because in, in Victorian England, you've got to remember that when when the the state the, the Education Act came out, it was Victorian yeah. England with different values, different culture, different way of doing things, perhaps. Yeah, and a different role for children. Well, look, for a, a myriad different factors and reasons, and I'm not blaming blame. I'm not even saying it's a bad thing. The way that children learn now mm-hmm. and interact with adults is somewhat different so they won't automatically sit in silence and listen to a soliloquy from you at the front of the class they won't. <laughs> you've got to you've got to get there and, to invest and engage yeah. why will <clears throat> they com- you're competing with a whole myriad of other different media social media that's the point you're yeah. competing with that so you have to sell it mm. you have to sell learning you have to sell knowledge yeah and growth to the kids in ways that <clears throat> arguably it didn't i mean when people say to me what do i what do I do? And I say a teacher. They'd say, well, what do you teach? Now, I could either say English or I could say children. 
I'm not yeah. being facetious about that. And yeah. I tend to say children. Because that's my that's my that's my specialist knowledge, if you yeah. like. It's not it's not the delivery of the subject that yeah. matters as much to me as how that child's receiving it and how they can flourish, you know. Yeah. So I think it's a different job as a teacher now. You have to sell it. Mm. Whether you like it or not, you do. You've got to really sell it. You've got to get them to invest. It's not just about engagement, it's in, it's investment. Yeah. You want them to in, invest in themselves, you know. And, and invest in their education in, in a sense as yeah. well, isn't it? Yeah. And care about it. Well, that's the bit. That's the bit that you and don't see. And see a value in it. I mean, I'm old enough and ugly enough to remember um, Grange Hill. <laughs> Um, brilliant television series uh, <laughs> and of course it's not like that anymore and what I mean by that is it isn't just the case that you know all the kids sit at the back and they hate the teachers and the mm. teachers don't like the students anyway and we just yeah. we, we've all got an agenda we've got to get on with it so we might as well get on with it you know it's no longer the case to say as a teacher I will I will deliver this curriculum mm. and whether you accept it and learn from it or not is a matter for you i'm not saying that all teachers would have once said that but certainly there was a much more traditional model now it's it's a collaborative experience and you need to really get the children on side yeah because it ultimately they are their own best teachers and critics and reviewers and everything it's 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 internal motivation that you're after not extrinsic you know yeah. children won't do it just because i tell them to yeah and if they don't do it when i tell them to yeah well what sanctions do i have what can i do yeah and and, and children have realized that now yeah. and that's a good thing by the well, way no you can't do anything well precisely make me you know yeah well okay you sort of scratch your head a bit and think well, okay that's a fair point. How back, can I make back in the day you, you'd be able to cane them? Well, and and people would say, people would say back in the day maybe kids respected adults. I don't think they did. It's no, just that we had different. Them. Well, that's a difference. You see, that's yeah. the difference. And I'm, I for one, I'm delighted that I'm teaching now. Well, if rather we look at the result, back then, if we look at the result of that, of that, let's say kids from the sixties and seventies, yeah, now run the world today, and has the world ever been in a worse place? Since World War Two, it's it's, it's a matter I discuss not. with people all the time, actually. And the I people feel quite who come out of that it. education system, running our current government, the governments around not just the UK education system will mirror it's a, mess. a lot it's of a bloody mess. A lot of what was happening in other yeah, countries, yeah, I America. That. You talk to a well-informed, you know, switched-on, engaged eighteen-year-old now. Mm. By golly, they will tell you what the future could and should look like. Yeah. They really will, actually. And fair play to them, because we've stuffed it up, frankly. Mm. And the idea that you know middle-aged blokes like me sit around a table, middle-aged men or women yeah. like me sit around a table to think, how are we going to prepare our students for the future? It's absolute guff, because mm. they are the future. Mm. I'm going to switch into a Whitney Houston song any minute now. Yeah. I know I am. <laughs> I, I know I'm about to do it. And yeah. I've actually done this on stage before, actually. Yeah. <laughs> Accidentally, I started to say, I believe that children are the future. Teach them well and let them lead the way. You didn't think yeah. I was going to do this. Yeah, yeah, I didn't yeah. think I was going to do this. <laughs> uh, anyway, it goes on actually. And I, I, okay, I'm not. Maybe I'm not a huge Whitney Houston fan, yeah. honest. But I tell you what, it's a good message to say that the children. But the moment you say children are the future, mm -hmm. I mean that just sounds like BS. Well, of course they are. I mean they're going to oh, yeah. outlive me. But what I suppose I'm trying to say is they have the requisite attitudes and skills and uh, for their time. Mm -hmm. And we are forged in a different era and we somehow try and meet them in the middle mm. and that's why progress is slow because mm. we have to catch up yeah what would happen if we said okay show us mm. show us bits and bobs here i don't mean just discover learning for yourself i'm not yeah. i'm not as trendy as that but uh, there are elements in learning that i think the kids can teach me yeah and not assume that i'm the all knowledgeable one you know the all-knowing one in the classroom yeah so i think that's why progress can be slow i but think I, I think it's interesting because for like someone like yourself and then, you know, like a, a, a 10 year old boy in the world today, like when you were 10, the world would have been like, no offense, but it'd have been a very different place than it, than it, than it is today. Well, let's today. look at that. I mean, let's, I, I don't mind admitting yeah. that. I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm 100 and, 103. 104. You know, 104 nearly. 104 nearly. <laughs> no, I don't, mind, I don't mind admitting this. So when I was 10, yeah. I hadn't yet got my ZX81. What's that? One kit. <laughs> What's that? So it's my 1K computer. What 1K of what? I don't know what that means, but you know what that means. 1K means it's very small. What's I mean, 1K this, mean, this is, Martin? This is before the land of meg megabytes. Kill a kilobyte. One, one kilobyte. One kilobyte. ZX81. A kilobyte. Yeah, 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 yeah. So 1K. So the computer only could yeah, store yeah. a kilobyte. 
Yeah, well, well, I, but I hadn't even had well, it. Watch snores more but than no we, we didn't even have computers until. So I'm, I'm saying I hadn't even got my ZX81 okay. yet, and then it would lead to a ZX Spectrum, and then a, a Commodore 64. I remember this Commodore is, 64. This is in my teens, yeah. Yeah. So, so when I was ten, so we didn't have that. Obviously, there were no phones, so therefore there's no social media. There's obviously no internet, anything like that. I literally said to my mum and dad after school, "I'm off out. I'm off yeah. out on my bike. Yeah. On my striker, you yeah. know." And then my brother had a grifter. You know, yeah. um, the kid over the road had a chopper, you know. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm just sounding all nostalgic and old and irrelevant now, but it was so different. Well, strikers and choppers are still about. Yeah, well, I'm, there you go. I'm quite cool. Yeah, all of a sudden, I mean, well, sort of come round. There. But it's different. It's a different. It's a different world. Yeah. So, but and yet the pace of change has been so exponential, so quick in so other, so many other areas of the way we live. Apart from school, I've got to say, mm. the dynamic. How I would describe what school is to an alien, which is always my test. I've never had to do it yet. I hope to do it some day. Describe what school is. I think it largely it hasn't changed, which is developing academic intelligence, showing that you've done that through academic qualification and encouraging the children to work through rewards if they do and sanctions if they don't. Yeah. Now that, in a nutshell, is how school is fashioned. And we all know, we all know in education that school has a much, much better bigger and better role to play in children's lives than just that yeah but find it well that's hard where is it because mm -hmm. it's it's not visible because that's the curriculum yeah it's hidden mm. it's hidden and i remember i mean, i'm I, i'm sorry to hear that your school experience was bad but if i speak to other creative entrepreneurs like you and i don't mm -hmm. know many but i do know a few yeah. creative entrepreneurs who are very successful in business everyone that i know mm. who's in that sort of um field role that yeah. field says that their success is despite their school what a shame mm. wouldn't it be great if they said and this is because of my school i think because in the why is that was it squash with creativity squashed what was it you know um well my journey here is through <laughs> through rap music so right, i mean yeah. <laughs> it's a it's in it i'm going to ask you what's that <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's an alternative route. I mean, to, to yeah, building yeah. a business like 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 this, and to you know to do it through through music is an unconventional route to getting here. Mm. Um, and that that wasn't intentional either. That just it just happened. Like I didn't plan for that. That was just the way the as I was rolling out, you know, the cards on the poker table. They just go, oh, well, you do this, and then you'll do this, and then you'll do, and then you know, I'm not, here I am. Do you know what I mean? But I think. I was always very creative from from a child and I've always been like business minded. I was doing car washes yeah. from eight years old and stuff like that. So the two I've always had the two skills. I've always been like that. My dad's very business minded. He's Indian. Can't help it. Um <laughs> and, really? but like um in school I would say that neither of those things were really yeah, encouraged. That's what I thought you were gonna say. And they were the two things that made me me. Yeah, they made you. They they meant something to you. Well, I, I enjoyed maths a little bit. I enjoyed. Well, um, it was relevant. Yeah. I, I did enjoy maths. I don't know why, but I did. I was quite quite like numbers. Um, I enjoyed English, um, especially like writing poems and stuff like that. Cause it, was, it was like yeah, it was all lyrics. Yeah, it was the same. Um, but apart from and history, I enjoyed history. I'm a big history geek. Yeah, you still are. Actually. Yeah, you're my, banging on about history. Oh, I'm a bad Every time geek. we speak, you give me some history lesson. Yeah, I know, I'm a big geek. It's terrific. That and aliens is like it's terrific. terrible. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> it's, but how, how strange that you kind of come round to that. Yeah. Because I actually bunked off most of my science lessons when I was a kid for two reasons. One is they were at the top of the uh, top of the teaching block, and I have terrible terrible vertigo, so I was terrified about going up there. And the other the other reason is, frankly, the science teacher that I had at the time was boring. Yeah. And so I actually bunked off to my uh, father's uh, allotment shed, yeah. which was next to the school. Uh, with a little packet of silk cut and a little box of matches with yeah. tissue paper in it so you couldn't hear the incriminating <laughs> yeah, yeah and i'd run and have that you know and now years later i've got four kids that's why yeah. i look so knackered all the time yeah. and one of them ed is properly into science oh really and i have oh properly uh, astrophysics and all that stuff and i have discussions with ed about science and here i am many many years later thinking why did I miss those science lessons? Mm. Science is absolutely captivating. Yeah. So it's how it's sold. It's how it's sold, isn't it, to you? And I just think it's a shame that in your particular case, certain subjects were kind of almost shut to you, really, at such an early age. Because well, they, just they weren't, weren't sold to you, maybe. They just weren't really available. Like, oh, really, right. And they just weren't like... 
I don't know. It's I wasn't one for attending school either. Like I was, I was, I was not there more than I was there. So what would have got you into school? What would have made a difference? And how? How? So so the 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 eleven year old Nick now. Yeah. You know what? What can I do to get you into school? How I do think, I get you into school? Um. I think I think it's I think there's two parts to it. I think it's what's happening in the school and what's happening at home. Yeah, too. And I, I think agree. Th- there needs to be there needs to be a relationship between both. Yeah, spot on. Because there's a golf at the moment in some schools. Yeah, and my my, my personal life and my home life was quite was quite turbulent. It's quite it was it was very right. dysfunctional right. to say the least. Right. <laughs> um. So that mark because my home life was was so dysfunctional. Um. I took that with me. So bringing a dysfunctional mentality into a place that's very functional was like putting a square peg into a round hole. And there was no, that that functionality of school was so rigid that there was no room for fluidity within that. Brilliant, you and said it yourself. So I think when you come from a dysfunctional background, which a lot of people do, um, especially, you know, at that age, you, you, know, you know, life happens and, you know, that's what happens to a lot of people. Don't. So br- bringing that into a school environment, which is designed to be, as you said, like the whole William Forster original layout of it, it is it is a rigid robotic process. Yeah, it's a production of, line. It's a, it's a production factory line. line. It's a factory line. Mass production. So then you've a, got a faulty standardization. You've got a faulty product going on the conveyor belt, essentially, or one that that wants to do things differently. But that worked. You see, that production line, that Victorian assembly line worked in other aspects of our lives of course it did that's why we we became so successful in the victorian era yeah. so it worked so why wouldn't it work with pe- why wouldn't it work with people you well, see so the same we're approach people. Was, well precisely we're not cookies yeah. so the cookie cutter doesn't work but those those um factors if you like those aspects of education which is mass production mm-hmm. standardization which is required yeah. and quality control well, those three elements are still very real in education yeah. too. But that's okay. That's all well and good if you put widgets on them. But we're not widgets. No. We're people. So I can see. But I think rather than continue to be critical of of education, I think we should also recognise how much it's improved. Yeah. I mean, we're now properly having Ofsted inspectors coming yeah. into schools to ask us to report meaningfully on attitudes, behaviours, personal development, well-being. Yeah. Great! Yeah. That's fantastic that Absol- we're now doing that. Yeah. That's the hidden bit. Yeah. That's the hidden curriculum that's happening. All it's working away. Well, I feel that like as the it's as the new generation of teachers and head teachers are, are, are getting in there, and the old the old lot, you know the you know the people who were born in the fifties and the forties and whatnot. Who who were the old headmasters like? They would have been the headmasters when I was at school in the you know in the nineties and whatnot, like. They they they're retiring, and it's like it's the next generation of teachers, people like yourself, who are now who are a bit more forward thinking, who are who are who are, who are whose eyes are open to the fact that there's more to school than just ABCs and and well, times tables. And I'm gonna say I, I'm gonna say a little word in defence of those of those older teachers actually because I do because I think some of them. I mean, if you you know, we've all seen the brilliant Mr. Chips, you know. So I, I, th- I think if, well, maybe we haven't all seen the brilliant Mr. Chips. What's but, Mr. Know, Chips? So it's a classic, classic film of a, a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant I've teacher. I've seen it. <laughs> I really am sure. Brilliant, brilliant teacher. It was actually a remake as well. But, okay. Um, where so, so what I'm saying, I suppose, is that, you know, from Victoria, well, no, pre-Victorian times, because some schools have been around for centuries. So for, for eons and eons, there have been teachers who care, yeah. who love, oh, of who course. genuinely care about the well-being of their child. But the day-to-day agenda mm-hmm. was always the three R's. Right. So they were somewhat stymied by the fact that this is what I need to be seen to be doing, mm-hmm. but I know that this is landing uh, on a child who needs care, who needs mm-hmm. understanding, who needs sympathy and everything. Which may may some of which may have been happening if yeah. you were having a turbulent time at the time. So the teachers knew. The difference is, we are now being encouraged to talk to children about their mental health and well-being like mm. we weren't before. Right. We're also being given license 
yeah. to talk about these things. So it's not that teachers have become more caring and before they were less caring. Yeah. I think they just didn't There's have a mandate to... now to <laughs> actually do that. Well, we reckon well, because we're, t we're all about teaching the whole child. I mean, why yeah. would you just teach from the neck up? Yeah. Why would you just teach their head? Yeah. That's, that's, that's bonkers. That doesn't make yeah. sense to me. It's all connected. Yeah. So you have to have heart centered education, yeah. motivation, which is in your belly, you know. Yeah. It's all those other things which come together in this synthesis of a functioning person. Right. And that's why I think there's never been a more exciting time to teach there's never been a more difficult time to teach why mm -hmm. well because you're competing with all the outside influences as well i mean john dewey very famous uh, uh, deceased now but a, a very famous american educationist and author yeah said the problem with school is that what the child learns in school is seldom used outside right. and what the child learns outside Mm -hmm. It's very rarely used inside school. Yeah. And you just said that. There's yeah. a gulf yeah. between what you're learning at home and what means what 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 are what's meaningful for you at home. Yeah. What's important and relevant at home. And then what's important and relevant in school and there's a there's a bit of a gulf there. Yeah. And now I think we're beginning to see no you need to it's the whole life. Yeah. You need to sort of, you know, teach in ways which resonate with with kids today. Yeah. Which is not going to be a, a 30 minute rant from the front while the children listen and then copy from the board. I Just think it's going to be like that. I think the image of teachers is changing as well within society. I think uh, for for many years, people always thought teachers were really well paid and just did it for the holidays and whatnot. <laughs> but I think it's becoming much more common knowledge that actually teachers don't get paid that well. No, no. And compared to what we could. They have work ever. pretty hard, and it's a very difficult job. And I think the pandemic actually, um, as difficult as yeah, it has been for teachers, I think you know they've they've come through shining really because you know they they were frontline key workers at the end of the day they were they were taking responsibility for children of key workers who were making sure that the country still still operates i i could not agree more i could not and fair play and hats off to them and I, and I joined discovery education in 20 towards the end of 2019 i didn't see the pandemic coming uh, at all that's not why i did it but i i i i joined discovery to lead on professional development and all that stuff as you know but people have said since i i left the most recent headship i bet you're glad you're not in headship anymore during a pandemic and of course i'd be lying if part if, if i didn't say that part of me is believe that i don't yeah. have to deal with that but uh, the majority of me actually genuinely misses that and wishes I was part of the war effort if you like yeah why well because our our, our, our oath our Hippocratic oath if you like if we were in medicine mm. you know in teaching our Hippocratic oath our mantra is we act in loco parentis right so we act in place of parents yeah. during the day which means a prerequisite for the job is that you love the kids right you'd never be able to do this job if you didn't it's yeah. hard enough if you do and you can't switch that off yeah. you can't just switch it off and during a global pandemic if you've got 30 children in your class and you don't know how they're doing because they're in their apartment or house or flat mm -hmm. or whatever at home and they're not even in school my god you worry about that you know yeah. so hats off to the teachers who've managed to and of course what it's done is i think it's it's achieved the effect that now we're back together again mm. we realize that there are the soft fleshy parts to us it's not just about the academic intelligence yeah. it's when you when you face an existential threat like that which we have and many families listen to this will have suffered you know proper terrible bereavement yeah. you know, and threats and risks and all that stuff well it's about our health let's get the basics in it's, it, yeah. maslow's hierarchy needs let's talk about you know food and water and and shelter and mm -hmm. clothing and warmth and love and care and we'll and then eventually we might get to academic mm -hmm. academic education but let's let's put the basics in first yeah. you know and i think it's actually reminded everybody that we are at the end of the day we're not knowledge delivery systems you know uh, we're actually humans we're yeah. people you know and I, I, I like the fact that that's happened now. Yeah. And so we have, most schools now will have a well-being hub. Yeah. They'll have a mental health and well-being program. Yeah. They'll have ways in which they're upskilling and training their staff so mm -hmm. that they become much more efficient and proficient at supporting the whole child. That's teaching. That's mm. what teaching's about. Yeah. You can't have a maths lesson with a little child who's going through torment at home yeah. and being I'd picked on in the classroom. To learn. Well, <laughs> This is it. You can't. You exactly right. You can't then talk to them about simultaneous equations or oxbow lakes or bloody adverbial phrases or whatever you've got to talk about, which is in the curriculum for today, mm. the learning objective for today. If they're not in a place to do so, mm. if they're not 
you know, their health and well-being. Because children learn, I think, certainly younger children learn in their emotion. They learn through their emotional state. It's unconscious. Yeah. So much of learning is unconscious. It's subconscious. Yeah. It isn't even conscious. They're learning almost in that sort of dreamlike state yeah. that we might be in as adults when we dream, if you yeah. like, or where we sort of switch off. Yeah. And so uh, I think a discreet and you know formal lesson plan, and this is a learning objective, we're going to learn about verbs today. That's a kind of a transaction that isn't necessarily going to work if they don't if they're not in the right place to do it. Yeah. So you have to sort that out first, you know, because that's what lasts. Yeah. Rather than um, knowledge of the crook. I'm not knocking knowledge. No, of course. Of course. <laughs> but I think but I think I think what what we're both saying itself. here is that it, yeah, exactly. I mean, is there anything more important? Really, I mean, reading and writing obviously it's massively important because you won't be able to get through life without it. But well, predictive text probably would. I'm going to challenge you on that actually, which is an odd thing for me to challenge you because what? it's a relatively recent phenomenon. You know, this idea what, of reading and writing. Yeah, I mean, that's not the reason why we survived on the planet this long. It's not the reason why we're in this elite. No, but I 0. think... 0.1% or, or whatever it is. Well, with the technological changes... Survive. For example, okay, so if we look... How long we've been here? 200,000 years, okay? Human beings. Well, you're better at history than Okay, me. so we... Okay, well, <laughs> according to my knowledge, we've been here for about 180 about right. to 200,000 years. During that time, which I find mind-blowing, we've done nothing up until about 10,000 years ago, or 12,500 years ago, when civilization appears to have... Yes, that word. Come out of the ashes, and agriculture essentially was right. the, was the change. But pre, pre, previous to that, we were nomadic, so we'd be travelling, the coastlines, fishing, parasiting all resources, <laughs> moving on, and that's essentially how how human beings it's operated for yeah. 170 odd thousand years. I, I'm not sure I believe that because that, that, that's what history tells. That's the official stance on history. There is um, alternative history, people like Graham Hancock, who say civilization is actually much, much older than the past 12,000 years. Um, and if you look at stuff like the Sphinx and Tebekla Tepe and stuff like that, it might appear to be way older. Um, that's a different conversation. Point being, if over the past um, 12,000 years, 10,000 years, we've developed agriculture. From agriculture, mm. it's allowed mm. us to develop villages. Villages mm. allowed us to develop towns. Towns allowed us to develop cities. But essentially, it allowed human beings to collaborate in large numbers bigger than 150, which was actually the the, the cap that you could move around as a tribe without it becoming wow. a community wow. with hierarchy and structure. Um, that's so, interesting. Yeah, so that, that's essentially how we, we became a people who could stay in one place Irrigate the land, pro feed the land, have have livestock, and stay there permanently. And none of that required reading and writing, did it? Not originally, no. But as it developed, so then as society got bigger, the it became more complex. So the Sumerians were the first people around 6,000 BC, 5,000 BC, to introduce a court system. Uh, they introduced the education system. They introduced the sewage and water supply system. They introduced reading and writing. They were the first to do that and maths. Um, and it was originally in like symbolic form on clay tablets or whatnot. And that gradually progressed into papyrus, into the ancient right. Egyptians and further on into ancient Greek, Greek into Aramaic and Hebrew and then the whole Middle Eastern languages into where we are today. But that's, as far as we know that is the uh, origin of, of reading and writing and it was if you look at the arrival of reading and writing it marries up very much with the arrival of civilization but that's fascinating absolutely fascinating to me and we need to talk more about that because yeah, yeah. i'm learning a lot here and i love learning but <laughs> it, does that mean that the is that when the i so when civilization as we know it came along is that when the idea of scholarship you know came along of studying and because those words now are, and to a certain extent education are synonymous with this idea of, of, of writing yeah of reading but for me the broader definition of education is not in any way only fixed to this idea of scholarship of, of study study skills there's there's a myriad di I different think, ways I in think, which you learn i think it's the idea of reading. i think it's i think it is as society becomes less horizontal and it becomes more hierarchical or, or 
pi uh, pyramid like mm. scholarship essentially it differentiates people from the learned and the unlearned yeah, very much so so your people who work very the land so. yeah, yeah yeah and your people who without create the laws. those skills yeah yeah so how do you it's share information without reading and writing and i think as as we introduced an education system that was fought that was compulsory in 1870 like like you said earlier i think it goes to show that society had become so complex and so much more than a two-tier system of the learned and the yep. unlearned the, the manual laborers and the non-manual laborers that there's so much in between that that it's that hierarchy that i have a problem with really i i i but I'm uncomfortable with that because does it not mean that there are some children who who may not necessarily have a natural talent and why should they for for, for for literacy, for reading and writing particularly well and yet immensely gifted in other areas, in other skills that are just as valued, just yeah. as valuable, if not more so actually, than being a scholar, than well, being if, for somebody example, who's learned. If, if you suffer from dyslexia yeah. and you, you know, yeah, the, the talk, concept of, of children children. reading and writing is very difficult. I've got a friend who's extremely dyslexic yeah. um, and he struggles with, like he can't do social media. So he doesn't have the interact, he doesn't keep up with his friends as much. He doesn't keep up with trends as much because he's, you know, the concept of reading something is just, it, it's, it's, da it's daunting for him. So he can watch a film, he can watch videos and all that, obviously no problem there. But if, when it comes to reading, writing and communicating and being proactive in communication, which primarily comes through this, yeah, it does. then it, it does. becomes a problem. So that, that's why I think that <laughs> to not be able to read and write in oh, a, yeah, of course. where we spend you our chipper. lives on WhatsApp, yeah, you're, you're at a massive disadvantage if you can't do that. Yeah. But there's ways in which you can do that and and define what it means to read. I mean, I've had lots of parents over the years that say, oh, my, my son doesn't read and my daughter doesn't, mm. is not a reader. Well, hang on a minute. Let's just look into that. Yeah. They may not be plowing through Anna Karenin every night. You know what I mean? They might not be learning you know, War and Peace or something. Yeah. But they are always <laughs> reading. They might be reading, I don't know, game game cheats. Yeah. Getting codes that they can cheat on the game. I don't know what they're reading, but they clearly might be stuck to their phone or they might actually be reading your expression right now because yeah. they're good at they're good at that sort of reading reading yeah. people yeah. you know or there's some children that i've met who are very very gifted readers of the ball readers of the game yeah in midfield they'll just read the game you know what? so that's, beautifully that's, that's interesting isn't it How, define reading. the word read uh, that's a good one right so read reading someone's body language reading someone's behavior well, reading someone's energy yeah yeah it's just as important and okay here's one for you what is more important right reading and reading in the conventional sense or reading a person which would get which would you be <laughs> completely effed without <laughs> oh god well again it's just kind of an arbitrary sort of sorting and ranking now isn't it really this is what we do isn't it uh, oh, I would not want to be without the ability to read. No, I'm going to switch at the end, actually. I was about to say, I would not want to be without without the ability to read people. Of course I wouldn't. But even, even worse than that, I think, would be to be denied any sort of access to the written word. Yeah. Really, I think. Well, I... I it's an arbitrary division. I can't really divide it like that. I'm not even going to ask. I don't know. Pass. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Well, it's it, both, it, isn't it? It's an impossible But I know thing. which one is yeah. valued most at the yeah, moment. Well, like, well, and that's what I'm uncomfortable with. That's unfair. Well, that's the, the point is that, that so you, I said to you to choose one of those things. And as, you know, an expert in education for 20 odd years, <laughs> yeah. you couldn't. No, no. But that's our point, education system would suggest that reading and writing towers above any of those things but is that because they're measurable that's the point it you is, see yeah. that's the bit it's the measurable and the imme immeasurable yeah. and the immeasurable um in other words your emotional intelligence yeah. and your feelings of self-worth and yeah. self-belief and your love and your capacity to yeah. to care for others and all those important things that make yeah. us human are less measurable um and so therefore um 
if if it can't be counted it doesn't count you know yeah. and and uh, people have often quoted back to me the opposite of that which is a quote from einstein which is that not everything that counts can be counted mm. and th that's a champion you know, that's 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 an argument for the hidden curriculum but i would challenge that as well because when people say well not everything that counts can be counted andrew i'd say well have you tried actually mm. actually so i'm not saying that we want to send children home the reason i bang on about the hidden curriculum all the time is because i think we could do much more now not to measure and percentageize somebody's curiosity levels right mm. so we're not i don't want my daughter to go home with a b minus in curiosity that's that's that is proper bs because that's the teacher's fault because <laughs> she, used to be, she used to be really curious and now she's not well that's yeah. not her fault that's yeah. the teacher's fault that's you, so they, i don't want being that bland, yeah. completely so i don't want that but i do think i'd like to be given a diagnostic right on her levels mm -hmm. and i've always banged on about levels and i'm not talking about her grades her academic grades i'm mm. talking about can we come up with a way of commentating, mm -hmm. commenting, reporting meaningfully on her levels of self-belief, on her levels of uh, cooperation, collaboration, participation, just her levels of self-worth, her levels mm -hmm. of curiosity, yeah. her levels of creativity, yeah. all the human facets, if you like, not all of them, cause quite a few, but can we just have a discussion about that yeah. and not expect me to infer that from a grade? Yeah. Because the danger when you infer and try and work out how my child's doing from the academic grades alone mm. is that it's it's too late to mm -hmm. wait until the next term mm -hmm. when you see her grades have gone down yeah to then scratch our heads and say what's what's wrong with now well i well, I, had, I had a teacher there's lots of things that might be you know i had a teacher i remember, I remember when I, I remember this i was about eight years old and my mom and dad went to my parents evening and my teacher said to them that and this is like i'm seven eight definitely no older than eight that i'd showed no ability in anything Right? What? This is so sad. Exactly, it's crazy, what, right? That, 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 what? That you'd showed no ability well, apparently in her, anything. Apparently, her exact words were, "He shows no ability in anything whatsoever." So you were basically a, a, a quick doorstop. A I mean, quick you know, doorstop, yeah. draft excluder. I mean, I'm trying to think of your purposes for you, really. Well, exactly, yeah. That is desperately sad. Yeah. I mean, this is a talk about a seven-year-old child or eight-year-old child. I mean... Well, you were just written off. Yeah, uh, by that... Well, I mean, you only have them for, for a year, don't you? So, I mean, my next teacher, I think, was was a different experience. But this, but I remember not really connecting with this teacher anyway. I'm not surprised. I think I'd have connected with him in a different way, to be honest. But she had, like... <laughs> Crikey. She, I don't know. But that stuck with me. Because yeah. I made me think, am I thick? Do you know what I mean? What, did you hear this then? My dad, well, my dad told me. I said, what, what yeah. my teacher say? He said, well, it's how you said this. Basically, you're not good at <laughs> probably anything. Shouldn't, probably shouldn't have told me, but he did tell me. And it stuck with me. And I remember for a long time, I think I was thinking that I'm thick or I'm not very bright or I should be like the bottom of the class. Or, you know, in school, you got you got the clever ones. I remember immediately thinking, well, I'm not in that group. So I'm in like the, the non-clever group. And so in the non-clever group is the people we mess about generally. Yeah, because they don't see the point. Otherwise. And then I think that starts a trajectory that you. But you know why they mess down. about? I think. Well, at least my view on why they mess about is because they're lacking self worth. Yeah. And 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 by the way, the self worth has been beaten them out, beaten out of them. Frankly, yeah. you know, literally. Well, hopefully not literally, but it's been, it's been kicked out of them. And if you don't have self worth, if you don't if you don't think you're worth anything, mm -hmm. and from that conversation we've just had yeah. at the age of seven or eight, you might have thought you yeah. weren't worth much because the teacher said so. Yeah. And you believe them. Uh, you don't have the next important facet above self-worth, which for me is self-discipline. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have self-discipline, you're going to mess around exactly. because why bother to behave and if you're not worth not anything? Not many kids have self-discipline. It's still a learned skill, a skill that's learned. I mean, I've only just got it now. Nobody's disagreeing here, yeah. actually. Nobody's no one's disagreeing, disagreeing no. So, Yeah, yeah. No, that's an important part of... But you see... Can I tell you what happened to me when I was yeah. at, at school? Because it's it's the reason I went into teaching in okay. the first place. So I was a little, I was 10 and a half, maybe just 11. Yeah. And my form teacher, whom uh, we all loved very much, he was a great guy, actually. Yeah. We just really liked him. He's just one of those really cool, really cool sort of mid-20s. Yeah. Really good looking, really active, yeah. very sporty. Yeah. And a uh, great teacher. And everybody just kind of wanted to be like him. Yeah. Well, I went home on a Friday night, uh, said cheerio to him and to my mates, went yeah. home, came back to school on a Monday morning, went into the classroom mm -hmm. and everybody was uh, in silence. And there were a few people in tears. I'll never forget it. As long as I live, I'll never forget this. I went into the classroom and I said, what, what, what is going on? And my mate uh, 
came and showed me a little cutting from the morning's Birmingham Post and Mail because this was in the Midlands and he showed me a little cutting from the newspaper and it said that uh, this this teacher of ours had uh, been climbing in Snowdonia over the weekend and had fallen and died and it was so sudden so unexpected because teachers don't die they're part of the furniture if yeah. you even see a teacher in Tesco's you just can't quite believe no, it what's no, that yeah. all about they belong in school yeah. they are literally you've got, you've got the blackboard the whiteboard you've got, you've got the desk you've got the chairs you've got the teacher you've got the books yeah. you've got the pens print sticks they don't die they yeah. don't die and I was lost I, I cannot I mean, I'm upset even thinking about it now and it was it just left such a profound effect on me and it and we waited in the classroom and we watched the clock move and we saw his empty chair and empty desk and we just literally sat there looking at his empty chair and registration came and went and nobody came in and then eventually the deputy head came in very experienced deputy head lovely lovely man and was was he was clearly very cut up and upset about it and said you know we just have to get through this you know and uh, and that had a profound effect on me the role that a teacher can play mm. in your life when they're not there you've noticed yeah. it, you know you kind of notice it when they when they've gone and that made me realize what was it we loved about this person was it his his uh, was it the actual curriculum that was he was teaching not particularly mm. although i like the way he sold it to us it was actually just the love he gave us you know yeah. what i mean and um, he he never missed an opportunity to help us feel good about ourselves. Yeah. That's, what that's what a teacher does. That's yeah. what a teacher does. Do you know what I mean? They will see every opportunity during the day to give you those little micro-affirmations mm. where you just say, hey, you've got this. Yeah. And not enough people did that to yeah. you by the sounds of it at the age of seven. Well, that, that one... Do you know what I mean? Bad, I had good teachers as well. Just that one particular teacher was bad. But I mean, I, on the opposite end of that, I, I remember teachers from secondary school who were amazing and filled me the other way. So... One, one, one maths teacher in particular, Mr. Addison, if you're watching, mate. Um, but yeah, no, there was... That. That's lovely. I had some really good teachers as well. So it, but it just goes to show the power of a teacher on a pupil, isn't it? At the end of the day, whether that's... The, the, a teacher has a power to be such a positive... Yeah, huge opportunity. Changing influence in, in, in a child's life. Yeah, huge opportunity. Because I genuinely think... I've not really changed in character since I was eight. So that's over 40 years ago. Yeah. Over 40 years ago now. Um, I've not really changed. I mean, I haven't, first of all, I haven't really grown very much, mm -hmm. which is obvious. <laughs> but I haven't really changed in my character. So all the things I liked, uh, disliked, hopes, dreams, yeah. fears, things I thought I was good at, things I thought I wasn't really good at and never would be. I'll be honest with you, I don't think those things have changed. They haven't. If I well, they, they say now, you become fundamentally who you are in the first eight years of your yeah, life. Yeah, you do. And then it's set. Yeah. It's forged. It's like a blacksmith's, you know, the why, crucible why of the classroom. That? Well, that's, that's, I, that's a biological answer. I'm not, I'm not about it. I'm not, I don't understand the That's crazy, how, but isn't that, it? That like, you, you, but you it is set. 48 can say that I have not changed since I was eight. But I haven't. I haven't. I got the same... Neuroses, the same phobias, the same fears, the same daft ambitions that I think I'm going to be able to achieve. I still haven't. The same um, preference for friends, or yeah. do you know what I mean? I, I, I'm there's still the same fidgety enthusiasm <laughs> and energy, and yeah. and uh, I'm damn gullible. You know, I love everybody, I trust everybody, and then yeah. I get shafted. You know, all that sort of stuff. That's not changed. That yeah. is, this hasn't changed. And and what put all that together into this amalgam that, that case hardened and was called Andrew. I mean, the very idea of Andrew Hammond is a, is a concept, isn't it? I mean, yeah. that's, a, that's a construct. Yeah. Well, what, what is Andrew Hammond? It's this construct that I have of myself. Yeah. None of the components that make up my body know that they're called Andrew Hammond, for no. God's sake. It's a construct. It's just a, it's a thing we made up. Yeah. And um, that was all put together by my mum and dad and my brothers and my extended family. And yes, absolutely by my teachers. And it wasn't from them teaching me about verbs. It was the way they treated me. Mm. It really was actually. And it, I was very lucky. I, I had a, I had a good education. I enjoyed school. Yeah. I still miss that form teacher whom I love. Yeah. Loved. I really do miss him, you know, yeah. and maybe that's the reason why I went into it, but I think it probably is. But I do think that, um, I'd have not properly changed. Mm. Do you think that you have changed then? No. In terms of your character. No, I don't think I have. I think I, I think, You're I mean, the same. just when you were saying that, I was thinking, you know yeah, what? Well, you... I'm still a geek. Like, <laughs> at heart like i'm still an idiot I mean, still I, like, I still like a lot of the same things like i was a big music fan at eight years old yeah, i still am i was big into like 
nerdy things like science fiction and history. Yeah, they're still that. I'm still really? like that. You're yeah, still like that. I've always been the same. What a great mixture, though. That yeah. Is. So I've always the things that I loved then. I like big big into sports then. Still big into sports now. Like the same. I love the same things. But how great yeah. right, if we said to teachers now. A teacher who's just qualifying now, right? Mm. And it doesn't matter how old they are. They might have gone into teaching late. That sometimes works well. So whatever their age, if they're about to qualify and they're about to start school now, right? Yeah. So it's September. They've just started school as a teacher. How brilliant, to, and it's daunting, but how brilliant to say to them, okay, you are not just delivering knowledge now. You're not just a knowledge delivery system. I know you've got your lesson plans. You've got your learning objectives. You've got your curriculum. Mm -hmm. Now, let's go and make people. Yeah. Let's do some people making. Yeah. You know, let's let's set the mold. Yeah. Let's really help them find their mold, find what makes them tick, and let's help them to sort of do that. And that's a hugely motivating thing to do as a teacher. And most teachers, they want to move the dial, they want to make a difference, yeah. and they want to help you find who you are. Yeah. What what an amazing privilege to yeah. do that. I mean, it's a staggering thing to be able to do. Yeah. But in some schools, it happens intentionally from a head teacher or a teacher who is intentional about the culture and they're doing it, everything is deliberate to help children flourish. And then in other schools, it happens by accident and it's a happy accident. Mm -hmm. And in the very worst schools, the culture is a toxic one, which has happened accidentally, but nobody's been intentional about it. They haven't noticed that you've got a, a culture of fear, a culture of competition, mm -hmm. a culture of rivalry, mm -hmm. a lack of care. Uh, and and that has a massive impact. Well, we've just we've just ascertained it has an impact yeah. on you. Um, and the rest, frankly, is about unlearning and unpicking. Then, do you think we could go too far? And that's far, a great though. shame. In in what in terms of in trying like, to care for the whole child? Or no, no, no. I don't mean that. I mean, do you think that as society is becoming politically correct on steads, that? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Uh, do I know what you mean? Of course I do. That we're becoming politically correct on steroids. And now that they're talking, I'm hearing that they're talking about having no winners on sports day. No one can win. What's the point? But are like, they? Is that the Daily Mail again? I don't know. I don't read the Daily Mail. No, I know you don't. I'm so sorry. I'd have I to ask you about the Daily Mail. <laughs> I don't read the bloody Daily Mail, but I know someone who does. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I live with someone who does. Uh, I know lots of people who do. I don't know. Is is that true? I don't know. I'm not in school. Is it? Is it? Have you heard this? Yeah, I've heard it, but I think it's BS to be honest. Do I don't think it's the case. I think it's 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 exaggerated. It's an inflated view. I th I think the reality is. Um, it is about taking part, you know. It's not actually just. I know. I know a lot of people say, no, no, no. It is literally just about winning, Andrew. That's yeah. the whole point. It's about winning. Yeah. I, I come from the from the school of thought that thinks it's actually about making sure everybody, as many people as possible, can take part. So I used to coach rugby. You never believe it, but yeah. I did. I was a very little rugby player, yeah. and I was a good one, a little scrappy one. But you were but it's little and I, fast. I was, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, nobody used to want to tackle the little, small, knobbly ones. Yeah. You know, tackle the the the, the bigger the big chaps. Ones. You know, yeah, a bit yeah. more. A bit more comfy, you know what yeah. I mean? Sorry, but you know the little knobbly ones. Like, but yeah. anyway, and I used to coach rugby. Yeah. Uh, all the, I loved it, absolutely, absolutely loved that. But um, I remember being 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 sent off a couple of times actually for kicking in the scrum. Yeah. I thought, you know, really, really quite tough. Actually, somebody just grabbed me and just oiked me upside down, yeah. you know, that sort of stuff. And I can't remember the point I was going to make, but it was a really important one about about coaching. Oh no, I'll tell you what yeah. it was. When I was a rugby coach, my main ambition was to try and get as many people in my wider team yeah. a game. Right. And if it meant pulling players off when they yeah. were in their prime in order to get through <laughs> 16 substitutes that were on the line and the yeah. parents were waiting to see them play yeah. and you've got to give everybody a few minutes each. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, I'd go for that. Yeah. I would always go for that. So maybe that's kind of the point of this inflated view that you've, you've heard, which is that it's not about winning. I um, think it's no about competition. I think it's about both. I think like if you destroy a culture of winning, you're going to create that's nonsense. Yeah, I agree. You're going to create a society of losers where no yeah, one's driven enough to be And there's no ambition. There's yeah, no ambition. I agree. I agree. But at the same time, I think within that winning culture of like look, if we're going to run a race, I'm going to try and win it. Or I'm going to do my best to win it. I might come second, I might come third, I might come fourth, I might come last, but I'm going to try my best. Well, 
I've got a good story about this because yeah. I actually managed to get into the school's cross-country team. Yeah. And we were taken off to Giggleswick up in Yorkshire yeah. for the county championship. I I am a former county championship cross-country runner. Right? Really? And I'm quite proud of it. Yeah, you wouldn't think it. And you know why? It's because on a, on, a, on a Wednesday afternoon when we had games and we and in the term that we had cross country i and, and two or three of my mates we we all, we all had to do the lap of the of a nearby sort of little woodland and you did four laps of the woodland and back yeah. to school and i set out with my two mates with my little pack of you know 10 pack of silk cut and a yeah. little pack of uh, matches tucked in the back of my socks and on the first lap we all dipped inside we all nipped inside the, the forest yeah and we puffed away yeah. and then we timed it just right that we joined on the final lap yeah. and then we went back to school and we did that every week every yeah. week i'm now admitting by the way this yeah. is what we did <laughs> and apart from this one time when we did it and uh, we mistimed it and we actually joined the front runners on the last lap back oh, wow. which meant that we were in the top top 10 you know oh. so I, I i had my punishment i had to be uh, sent on the cross country county championships amazing isn't it because wow. they, and I, I even when the head t the headmaster read out the results of the stage in the assembly the next day i think he was even even he was quite shocked to see my name on that what what's he doing here so that's why i can say but I, I i was ambitious about winning yeah but i didn't want to think that if I'm not going to win, I am therefore a loser. Exactly. That's the bit I challenge. Do you I know think what I mean? he's got. I think the embr I think the celebration of effort is where is what there should be. I think no effort, you should lose, yeah, and you yeah, should yeah. and you should feel what it is like to lose. You don't try, of you course, get you get the result of should. not trying, which You'll is never losing. Try otherwise, exactly. You'll never try. And I think I think you're a molly coddle. Cotton wooling that out. Yeah, I agree. No effort equals no reward. I agree. And, I agree. And they people should experience the harsh reality of what life will be like if you don't try. <laughs> I agree with you. Yeah. I just love the way you say it. Because <laughs> I bet you won't say this to your own. To your own. I would. Or maybe you will. I would. Maybe I definitely will. would. So you don't try, you're going to get nothing. You're going to be nothing and no one and no one will respect you. But if you put effort in, even if you're shit at it, even if you're crap at it, <laughs> it doesn't matter. I agree as with long you. As, as long as you, you have a try, go. As long as you try. Amen to that. I agree with that completely. I think that's that. all. You don't need to win. I agree with try that. Try and win. Obviously, I'd rather you win than not. But, but the problem is, it's not just on the sports field. The way that school is designed, yeah. going right back to the idea of the introduction of formal standard examinations for everybody, so yeah. 150 years ago, the way it's designed... It is sorting and ranking. There yeah. are winners and there are therefore losers by yeah. definition. And that's the bit I have a problem with. That's why I don't want to use the same system of, of measuring and uh, uh, grading mm -hmm. on the hidden curriculum of attitudes and behaviours and, and well-being. I honestly believe we should be coaching children to embrace failure with both hands. Because I think without being able to take the failure, what it feels like, and to get up, go again, lose, fail, whatever it takes. That's the bit, isn't get it? Get up, go again, get up, go well, again, I used get to call up, go again. fail. I mean, it's a typical thing that I might do in the classroom, and I'm sure you've heard this before, but to fail, a fail in, in, in my classroom was always first attempt in learning. And that's what the that's letters a, stand for. I, I love that. That's first brilliant. attempt in learning is fail. Yeah. And I, I, I was a real champion of yeah. failing. I'm There's bloody a lot of good negative at failing, stigma you know? attached to the word failure mm. and failing and and it, it, it's almost like weakness and inadequacy and mm -hmm. all these negative connotations are associated with the word failure. But I honestly, everything I've ever achieved in my life, and I'm, I'm, pr I'm proud of, 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 the, of, of my accomplishments so and how far be. I've come, is a result of multiple failures. Well, is it's Jeff. It, 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 wasn't it Jeff Bezos? I'm sure it was Jeff, Jeff Bezos. I, I heard him interviewed on Radio 4. And he was saying um, at Amazon, we are, words to the effect of, I think, or maybe even literally, we're very, very good at failing. We've failed many more times than we've succeeded. Because that's pe why it's people so only now. remember the win. That's right. They only remember the win. They, the they look at you and say, oh, that. it's a very successful person. That I would say, really, on, on paper, I'm just the biggest failure ever. <laughs> Because I've failed a million more Good times. For you. Yeah, but a million more times. But you keep going. You keep going. Because eventually you get it right. Keep if you going. learn and you keep trying, learn. Oh, why did I fail that time? Oh, I did this one right. I'll get up. Go yeah, but again, the yeah, but that. the stake the stakes are high in school. Mm. You can't afford to fail. School should be the safest place to fail, right? Because it's a practice for life. Yeah. School is a practice for life. Unfortunately, 
many children experience the reverse of that mm -hmm. that you're, and you're written off and, and not by the teachers deliberately just by the system yeah. so what I mean by that is if you fail in school you might get a bit of red pen yeah. <laughs> you might you might even get a lower grade yeah. that can sometimes serve as a self fulfilling prophecy yeah. do you see what I mean so it, we must be able to liberate children to be able to say right this is not being graded today this is not going to be marked we're not, I'm not going to write on this one let's all have a go and I don't think that happens enough mm. I think uh, what we call sort of no grade marking or uh, should happen more often but then as soon as you say something like we shouldn't have grades at least for this period of time couldn't we grade on effort you're accused well they are I mean there are schools that's why I've worked so hard on the hidden curriculum because and the hidden learning program as I call it all that because I've been in many many schools worked in schools where we have every half term you have an academic grade and an effort grade mm. so it might be an academic grade which is a letter an effort which is a number one to five so if you get a one that's brilliant yeah a lot of people got b2 b3 and the number is the effort grade the problem with that is what does that mean mm. Well, how, we need to drill down a little bit deeper into that because, frankly, the effort grade is a great deal more important than the academic grade. I'd, I'd say I so. I mean, of course it is. So we need to drill into that a little bit more. Because the, gr the academic grade can fluctuate yeah. according to the, a person's ability or how what their effort thing is. Let's say someone's put, got a 10 for effort and they've got a, an E or an F, right? It's a cruel result, right? But it, it's a reality, it's a, you know... Tell you what, if you try to get into the music industry, most people will get that result. Right, okay. They'd get a 10 for effort and they'd get an F. <laughs> right. But they're resilient, they keep going. But you got to keep that 10, then you might get an E a yeah, year later. Good, you keep good that lesson. 10, good you lesson. might get a D yeah. and, and then a C. And eventually, very few, which is why there's not many people that are successful in the music industry, some get an A. But hardly any. Of course, I mean, I, I got A's in the lowest effort grades, you know, when I was at school. No, I didn't. I'm I bet you lying. did. I bet <laughs> didn't. I absolutely didn't. I am your archetypal yeah. B grade student. Yeah. Uh, second 15 for rugby, second mm. 11 for cricket, B grade all the way through. Yeah. Um, and But I didn't apply myself. I should have worked. I could have. I, I wished I had worked even harder. Yeah. Why? To get a whole load of A's? No, I'm not bothered about that. I was an but extreme just to... either. Really good oh, were you? or really shit. No, I was, was consistently not... average, really. There was no, there was no, now as I have a use, like I've got, I've, got, I've got a few use, got a few E's. Was that a badge of honour? Were you so proud of those? I mean, uh, I did laugh actually when I got, I got a U in my G, one of my GCSEs. I didn't, I didn't think, I got, I got terrible GCSEs, absolutely terrible. Yeah, I mean, in this office, I'm the least qualified. I'm the least educated. Really? Out of everyone, out of all my team, out of all my staff. It's weird and yet that, without yeah. your efforts and your yeah. resilience... You, you wouldn't have this company. They've all got you've all got degrees, haven't you? Anyone not got a degree in here? Oh, Haley, my business partner. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, but I think that just goes to show. Like in here, technically, I'm supposed to be the boss, but I've probably got the least GCSEs, the least academic results whatsoever. No, no degree, nothing. But. Well, I'm the only one that went to university in, in my family. Oh, yeah. By far really? the least successful financially. <laughs> Are you the only one went to university? Yeah, yeah. I think my, my, my younger brother, um, many years after working, then did an MBA. Right. Uh, whilst working sort of thing. Right. I'm the only one that went to university yeah. uh, uh, when I was younger. And... Um, uh, but that's because I wanted to teach. I mean, that's why. You know, I didn't well, you can't go be just a teacher to, without going to uni. Yeah, I didn't want to just go to university because I just wanted two, three years of <laughs> oh. <laughs> fun. I don't, I don't agree with this idea up. that everybody should go to university. Why? Because I don't yeah. think university is the only way. Yeah. I don't. I think there are other just as important, valuable ways of, uh, of bettering yourself, of mm. uh, gaining a career, you know, isn't it? Again, it's that cookie cutter. There's an assumption, isn't there, in school that everybody's gradually on the road to university and a few people won't make it. That's mm. BS, that is, you know. It really is. You know what, There's though, other I am, options. I, I do want Kyra to go. I do want my daughter to go to university. I'm not really. Why? I'm not that bothered. Why? why? I don't know because I always part of me like always feels like, oh, would I have done better if you'd got a degree? Yeah, if I'd gone to so, university yeah, or I had that experience that of going to university. That's that myth. It's a myth. I don't know who's who's peddling that myth, but I think that's a myth. I think my dad. My dad's very like traditional education. Like he's got that sort of. I know what you mean. He he would attach great importance to yeah. this idea of. Um, because they, they do, they do over there still. You know, it's like it's still quite. It's still a. I mean, they do here, but I think it. 
in India because there's such a variety in social climate that to not have an education is almost a death a death sentence over there. So it's a sort of class system. Um, I just think it's the working opportunities. If you don't have an education, you're just not competitive at all to get a decent job because the population is just so high. Then there's just so many people who are living on you know below the poverty line that to not to even dream of not having an education or a good education would just be you know it'd just be a death sentence. Wow. Does that mean that teachers and teaching and and learning uh, enjoy high status over there in terms of how they it's yeah most definitely higher than here my perhaps. auntie and my cousin they're all teachers wow over there and you know what, actually wow. they they've got a really interesting business actually they so they are they're maths teachers but they teach like advanced maths to like children like six five six seven year olds on an abacus wow. And it's like it just a, shows, doesn't it? You don't yeah, it's like need mental Z-tech. arithmetic on a, yeah. and apparently, like yeah, that's my, interesting. My dad was saying that they're doing like these crazy equations that are six and seven year olds on an abacus. Wow! But it's, I mean, over that's what I mean. Over there, it's a lot more competitive. But I think uh, I I think you should join your uh, your relatives and become a teacher. I think you'd be a bloody brilliant one, actually. And I tell well, you, if what I would I teach? Be rubbish. History, duh. But what you've got is passion. It's your passion. I think you've got to have passion yeah. and you've got to be, I, I love to say this mantra, it makes me sound an absolute idiot. I like to say I'm not a teacher, I'm a learner. I mean, I sound like an idiot saying that, but it's true. But, <laughs> you it, but you're sayings, a learner, you? but you're, a, <clears throat> I, I make them all up, but you're a learner. <laughs> yeah. And that's the key bit, isn't it? <clears throat> I so enjoy I think learning. You do seem insatiably curious yeah. to learn more. Yeah. You do seem that. Unless what, you just, what is the you world? Know, what is the world if you're not learning from it? What's the point in life? There you go. I'll have that. I'll nick that. Thank you very much. It's another saying I'll have. But it, yeah, do you know the what great I mean? Nick, I heard from the great Nick and he said, nick what's the, the point of learning? Oh, no, I've missed it up. What's the point of life if you're not learning? Yeah. No, but, but that's the point. That's the point. So in other words, it isn't a case that um, everything you teach as a teacher, you're just teaching. So that yeah. lovely Mayor Angelou, yeah. uh, of course, brilliant Mayor Angelou quote that people may not, may not always um, remember what you they may forget what you said but they'll yeah. never forget how you made them feel and I think you would make you would help children to feel good about themselves yeah. they'd be inspired by I think that's what this discussion's turned into I'm quite pleased where we got to this is a campaign to get you teaching recruit me as a teacher yeah I think you'd be really really good actually no, I, I think you'd have a sense of I'm fun I'm too undisciplined um, 9 till 3 every day no way Ah, no it does way. require huge reserves of self-discipline. No, I couldn't. Too rigid, too Nine till three? Nine till what? Bloody eight till eight. Oh, Come on. No way. I've never met a teacher that's managed to I'd do I'd last nine a week. Three. I'd last about two days. Well, I must admit, I've had the uh, best part of my career in teaching and um, I'm looking forward very much to getting Returning. into it again. Yeah. You know? and, uh, and the reason for that is I miss being part of somewhere... Um, where you are genuinely seeing growth yeah. in children and you're just seeing them start to, and with your gorgeous little one, yeah. you know, her teachers yeah. will, and you obviously, yeah. and Hayley will gradually see her arrive yeah. as her. Yeah. That's and amazing. It's like a Russian doll, you know, and, yeah. and then you get to the, the biggest version yeah. at the age of eight, a few years yet, yeah. she's arrived. And to have a hand in that, just to, just to be, just play a very small part in that. Yeah. It's not about legacy for me. Yeah. It's frankly quite selfish because I just want to do what motivates me, which is to be there On when the children line, find themselves. Yeah. And that's she's not defined by the grades that she'll. She, I'm sure she'll achieve brilliant grades. Yeah. But she she won't be defined by the grades that she'll achieve. No. She's defined by her own quirky sense of humour and her charisma and her character. And, and a things. big hair. <laughs> and at the moment, her big hair. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Her, her big hair I mean she's just unique and and what she wants and I would have thought as parents well certainly I don't know whether you're the same but certainly for me as a parent I just want teachers who will know my kids like I know them yeah and love them like I love yeah. them and, and if if you get that right and take care I genuinely of them genuinely think everything else follows them. you start with love and you kind of work out from there and and you know bespoke tailored teaching is about knowing the children in front of you and not, not going for the cutty, cookie cutter approach mm-hmm. of widgets, uh, which might be an easier life for you, frankly, but it just doesn't, it doesn't cut it anymore. Literally, yeah. it just doesn't work. You have to really get to know the child 
and fight because I, I always think you can teach pretty much any children anything yeah as long as you have to go through your entire toolkit until you get the right method yeah that works with that child yeah or the right i was an english teacher the right book yeah. that captivates their interest yeah and and i think that's what that's what teaching is about it's a big ask mm. it's a big ask it's a big job you know but hey there are lots of other difficult jobs you know, teaching's not the only one <laughs> what i'd really like to do is because i don't I know that you're going back to, to being a head teacher. I am, yeah. Um, Looking forward what, to it. What I'd like to do is in six months' time, do this again. <laughs> <laughs> I probably won't even want to talk about education. Yeah. But I'd like, to see, I'd like to see how what, what the reality is like now post-pandemic. Yeah, yeah. I, well, I'm, I'm so desperate to see what that's like now. Yeah. And I'm, not, I'm under no illusions. They have had a proper, proper rough ride. Yeah. A really tough couple of years. No question about that. But it, 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 it's actually because of that that I think I'm drawn again to, to, to hunger down, to join the war effort and to yeah. be part of that um, community where you... I mean, let's face it. I mean, it's amazing where I'm working at the moment, by the way. Mm. Brilliant company, great values. Yeah, amazing. And I'm going to stay close to them and, yeah. and do lots of work with them already. Uh, uh, continue to. But... You know, at the moment, it's difficult to join a uh, recorder club on a Tuesday or go and go and teach some philosophy or go and run a book club or go mm. and coach a rugby team. How mm. do I do that? Mm. Who, who do I do that with? You know, yeah. there, are, there are magical things that happen in a school. Yeah. That once you've experienced them, you just miss them. Yeah. You know? But yeah, hey, I'd love to come back. Uh, I might be a bit greyer, probably. Yeah. A bit more, more stressed. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? I think some stress can be good for you. Yeah. I do actually, I think that. Just not too much. Oh yeah, I think you can overdo it. Yeah. You know, and I'm not saying, hey teachers, it's great to be stressed, isn't it? I mean, that's ridiculous. But yeah. I think just a little bit of stress to keep you pepped up. You know? Yeah, keep your eyes white. Yeah, yeah, I think so. But um, we'll look forward to it. We'll yeah. see what happens. Thank you, Andrew. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs>